It's a sad but true fact that your life expectancy is pretty much determined by where you live on the planet. Take a child in the poorest part of the developing world. That child is 17 times more likely to die before the age of five as one born in Canada. Here's another fact. If your home is here in Canada or the US or Germany, you can easily expect to live into your 80s. But if your home is in Swaziland, Mozambique, or Zambia, your life expectancy is just half of that. That's 40. Is it fair? Well, of course it's not fair, but why does it happen? And what can we do about it? Well, two doctors, Abdallah Dar and Peter Singer, have been working together for more than a decade to bridge the atrocious gap in global health. They've made it their mission to fund ideas that improve community health, including a few controversial ones like tweaking the DNA of mosquitoes to prevent the spread of malaria. It's pretty amazing stuff, but how do you take the knowledge out of the lab and into the hands of those who need it most? Well, for Dar and Singer, the goal is clear match the life expectancies of children born in Africa to those born in Canada. And it's all laid out in their new book called The Grandest Challenge, Taking Life-Saving Science from Lab to Village. Everybody, please welcome Peter Singer. Hey, doctor, how are you? Great. Nice to see you. And you. I'm happy to have you here. Um, it's great to be here. It's always, uh, it's always a great conversation. I, I, I'm so fascinated by the concept of sustainability and how you get the developing world and the so-called developed world uh, to, to work together. Especially in light of something like today, the Lancet Journal came out and said that um, climate change will be like the biggest threat to the developing world. Warmer temperatures means more malaria, more dengue, mm -hmm. lots of realities here. So, I mean, as you approach, what's the biggest thing that needs to change to get more of a balance? The biggest change is we need to commit ourselves to um, justice and writing inequities. You know, I want to thank uh, you, George, for the work that you do for hunger. Good nutrition is the beginning of, uh, of global health, and at the core of that issue is justice. So whether you're talking about hunger, whether you're talking about climate, whether you're talking about uh, global health, these things all have to do with uh, people in the developing world having just the same right to a full life and a life as people in Canada or the United States or anywhere else. And I agree with you, but do you think that the other countries, the developed world, has any political will or interest to fix that, to right those wrongs? Well, you know, um, the, the uh, Grand Challenges uh, movement is really all about uh, people in different countries working together. Yeah. Um, and let me give you a great example of okay. a sustainable solution. I don't know if you've ever been presented with... Sock. Uh, that's a sock I wore to the gym this morning, George. I don't know if you... Uh... I'm not afraid. <laughs> I'm not afraid. But it gets to your... I'll eye... tell you what, it's not sweaty enough, which means you didn't get your cardio up, is yeah. what I'm talking about. Just give it a sniff. Okay, no thank you. It, uh... <laughs> it gets to the idea, though, of the sustainable solutions you're talking about. Okay. Because who would have thought that a sock like that... Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. A sock like this can actually save lives. So, uh, Grand Challenges Canada, which is funded by the Government of Canada, over the summer with the Gates Foundation, funded this guy called Fredro Sakumu, who noticed that kids playing soccer, their stinky socks attracted mosquitoes. He built a box to attract the mosquitoes with the stinky socks and kill them, and that's a way to deal with, uh, with malaria, which kills 800,000 kids around the world. So sustainable solutions, George, mm -hmm. are about local people helping their own families and communities and countries like Fredro Sakumu. The responsibility of an organization, a company, and certainly we see it with the big pharma companies, is profit. That's yep. what they're driven by. Is there a business model in global health? The, do these, com these companies have any interest? Like, why would they want to create global health? Yep, so let's talk about two types of companies. Uh, one is uh, multinationals. You know, the low point of multinational engagement in global health was about 10 years ago when they were suing the South African government around antiretroviral patents. That was unbelievably horrible at a time people were dying for want of access to antiretroviral drugs. Morally bankrupt is what they were. It was just morally bankrupt is a good way to put it. But you know, some of those same companies are the ones now involved in developing a malaria vaccine. So it's really about bringing out the best in those companies because they do have the technologies, they do have the marketing. But you know, the future is not in the multinationals, in my opinion. The future is in small and medium enterprise in the developing world itself. Let me give you an example. I visited three or four times a company called A to Z Textile Mills in Arusha in Tanzania, and it makes bed nets. You know, bed nets are the first line of defense against malaria. For sure. It makes 25 million bed nets a year, largest manufacturer of bed nets in Africa, and employs 6,000 people. So talk about sustainable solutions. 
Imagine a future with 100 A to Z textile mills across Africa right. and what a difference that would make. But can you make that sustainable? I think, I, I like what you're talking about. Do you see how that can actually work there and how it will and how someone will build it? Ab absolutely. So we um, have uh, chronicled a lot of technologies. We call them stagnant technologies. They're just stuck. People all around the world, George, especially young people, have fantastic ideas. The only question is whether those ideas are used or they're wasted. I was wondering how this, would, this stuff you're talking about would impact a place like Attawapiskat. Yeah, excellent question. And you know, some of the technologies uh, that we develop, which are really for remote rural areas, uh, could be very relevant. The flip side of it is, we actually in Canada have a very strong presence in um, Aboriginal and circumpolar health research that we can share with, uh, with indigenous people around the world. So we're all interconnected and that Aboriginal, uh, our Aboriginal communities are very good examples um, of the uh, potential interplay between global health and things right here in Canada. What do you think about this conversation that, I mean it's legitimate because it's geographical, that a lot of the developing world is dealing with severe issues of health. When you talk about malaria, dengue, places like Congo that have all kinds of health challenges, in part, and not an insignificant part to geography. You know, we live in colder climates and even in the states where we don't have malaria, we don't have dengue, we don't have a lot of the challenges based on geography. Absolutely, and, uh, and we, the fact that we don't have it doesn't mean we're not gonna get it, mm -hmm. especially in the southern United States, et cetera, as a result of climate change. So what I think about that is anybody who thinks global health is over there and we're over here, we're okay, is wrong because global health really affects us all. There you go. The grandest challenge, taking life-saving science from lab to village. Dr. Peterson, everybody, we'll be right back.